Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Lang. <laughs> Uh, for those that don't know, so you can say it much louder in the next second or two, my name is Dr. Tony Lang, and I'm the director of the Morton and Gloria Shulman Movement Disorders uh, Clinic. And uh, so I'll say good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Dr. Very good. They learn well, quickly. Okay. Uh, welcome to uh, what I think is now the fourth or fifth of these, uh, sixth, holy mackerel, the sixth of the speaker series that uh, were the brainchild of uh, um, Liza Jerome from the uh, foundation. And uh, when she first came to us discussing this idea, it, uh, it uh, really rang a, a resonance uh, with the faculty. We recognized the importance of uh, sharing what goes on in our field uh, with the people who are touched by the diseases that we deal with. And um, I think it's very important for you, uh, and I hope you appreciate that you are family. Um, in fact, yesterday I saw a patient, uh, we had a very nice, uh, good resident working with us yesterday, and uh, two of our patients complimented this young guy for the great job he was doing, but one of the patients said, you know, I came and I sat in the waiting room and everybody welcomed me and it was friendly and we chatted and I felt like I was a part of a family. And um, I hope that a lot of you feel that way. I know you don't want to come to a movement disorders clinic, I know you don't want to have the diseases that we're seeing you for, but I hope you feel welcome. I hope you feel well treated. I hope you feel respected. I hope you feel that you're part of the team trying to solve the problems that we're all working to, to solve to get rid of these diseases. Uh, so we have a common goal, all of the faculty in our Movement Disorder Center, to solve the diseases and hopefully eradicate them eventually. Now that's wishful thinking, admittedly, but uh, I've always said that um, when I'm ready to retire, and I'm getting a lot grayer, but I'm not ready for retirement yet, but when I'm ready for retirement, I really want to be able to look back and say, I've seen the course of these diseases change in the time that I've been doing it. And I think that the work that we're doing here at the uh, Morton and Gloria Shulman Clinic and the Edmund J. Saffer Program in Parkinson's Disease um, really is getting to where we need to be. And uh, you're hearing at these uh, speaker series lectures cutting edge work by people that really are very dedicated to getting those answers and trying to help you um, really change the course of your disease. So we're very fortunate today in having uh, uh, Dr. Robert Chen speaking to us. Now, I just remembered one thing that I wanted to say before we started. Uh, those of you that have attended these talks before rem may remember, I hope, that we've always thanked uh, John and Sheila Milne for their ongoing support. They've been very supportive of these particular uh, uh, speaker series in the past. And unfortunately, since our last uh, meeting, both of them have passed away. And so uh, we have passed our condolences to the family. Uh, they were strong supporters of what we're here to learn from and celebrate, and hopefully uh, their contributions will see us uh, move forward, and uh, hopefully today you'll see some progress in that area. So Dr. Chen, uh, we were very fortunate to recruit uh, away from a couple of other big Canadian centers when he was uh, starting to look for a job. He trained in electrophysiology. He actually worked here as a student, right, with Dr. Peter Ashby. So I knew him when I was first starting my uh, faculty position here, and he worked with one of our electrophysiology colleagues and described some really important aspects of some of the uh, disorders that we deal with. He then went away and did neurology, uh, trained at the NIH with a, a very famous electrophysiologist by the name of Mark Hallett, and then started looking for a job, and we were very fortunate when he accepted a position here. I've uh, fought to keep him here, and fortunately I've succeeded so far. Um, be nice to him so he stays, um, because as you'll see, he's doing work that I think is really quite unique. Uh, he and many of the people that come to speak to you at these speaker series are international renowned experts in, in their own right in different fields. So at every one of these sessions, if you've been attending, we've talked about drugs and pharmacology, we've talked about surgery, we've talked about basic science and cell mechanisms, and now today you're going to hear about electrophysiology. We're, you're going to hear about how Dr. Chen uh, studies brain function both in normal individuals and in individuals with the diseases of interest. You're going to hear how he's uh, really expanded our understanding of how 
interventions change the brain. For example, deep brain stimulation. I'm sure he's going to tell us about, a bit about that. So I'm uh, going to uh, pass you on to Dr. Chen. He's uh, going to spend uh, a fair amount of time presenting to you. Um, then I'm going to come back. I've got a, uh, other commitments, so I'm going to run in and out, but hopefully I'll spend uh, a fair amount of time here. And then uh, I'll come back and uh, sort of uh, direct the question and answer and wrap up. And then at the end, uh, if you're interested in hearing more about research or if you're interested in participating in any of the research, we're going to have people with trainee stickers on their chests so that you can talk to them and find out more that's happening in Dr. Chen's laboratory, for example. Now, Dr. Chen, foolishly, has, uh, uh, well, initially not foolishly, he played tennis and injured himself, uh, injured his, his uh, calf and then foolishly was traveling with an injured leg and uh, tore the Achilles tendon further, or tore his uh, muscle and has had to have surgery. So we're going to allow him to sit down and look nice and comfortable and uh, present to you and take it away, Robert. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to come and speak to you today. Um, let me see if it's, okay, you can see the slides. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, something called brain plasticity. And I'm going to talk about how this related to Parkinson's disease and dystonia and how we have studied this entity we call uh, brain plasticity. Um, okay. So what is brain plasticity? So brain plasticity is basically the ability of the brain to change and adapt. And it's a very important function because well, it relates to how the brain cells change, but perhaps more importantly, how one brain cells, one group of brains are connected to the other group of brains. So how different brain regions are connected to each other. So it is a process, it's very basic, it's underlying like learning and memory, so we have to have brain plasticity able to learn and remember things. It is something that mediates, so we have a brain injury, say a head injury, a trauma, or a stroke, someone recover from it, it is mediated by this process of brain plasticity. So that is a very important process to study. However, um, not, plus it's not always good in that sense. So some of you may know, for example, that people who have amputation may have something called phantom pain. So basically they feel that there's pain in the arm or leg that's amputated already. And this is thought to be due to an abnormal type of brain plasticity. So, but the reason I'm talking about it today is that um, we and others have done studies to show that brain plasticity is abnormal in people with uh, Parkinson's disease and dystonia. Okay. Um, so, how can we study brain plasticity? So, there are people who study animals, so we can say, uh, put in a recording instrument, electro with an animal, and record brain activity, but also we don't do that in human subjects. So, different ways that we can use to study brain plasticity. So, but in this talk, I'm going to concentrate on two methods. So, the first method is we call transcranial magnetic stimulation, or we can also call magnetic brain stimulation. And the second method, I'll touch on briefly, is called functional uh, and magnetic resonance, or MRI. I think many of you are familiar with MRI, but functional MRI is a slightly different type of MRI. So I'm going to first talk about uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation or magnetic brain stimulation. So what is it? So it is, we call a non, so we want to stimulate the brain and see what happens when we stimulate the brain. But we want to do it, we call it a non non-invasive manner. Non-invasive means that there's no surgery involved, you know, we can just put something on the top of the head and slim the brain. So the way it is done, I think some people, some of you who are interested in the physics of this, is that we put the wire coil on the head. The wire coil has a current, electric current go through it, and people who know physics is that this will induce a magnetic field that's perpendicular to the coil, and this will in turn induce an electrical current in the brain underneath. And, and for the interest, the current that flows in the coil is opposite direction to the current that flows in the brain. So in a sense, we are stimulating the brain indirectly through a magnetic current induced through the, uh, the scalp and the skull. The way that we usually do it, we put a coil on the top of the head. They come in different shapes. So we show you this called a figure eight shaped coil. So it's more focal. We just stimulate a small area. And what it will cause a twitch. And they say, because the left brain controls the right hand and the right hand, and the right brain controls the left hand. Too. So you assume the left brain, you cause a twitch in the right hand. And what we usually do is 
use uh, recording to record the twitch activity, and we can measure it and quantify it. So this is just an example. So someone sitting here being putting a call on the head and recording activity on the other side, hand muscle to stimulate the brain. So what we're going to do here now is to have a demonstration of uh, this magnetic stimulation. So you know, just like, see what it's like. And so we have several colleagues uh, from my lab here. Now what we're going to first do is, so this is a, um, so we in, this induce a fairly strong current and a magnetic field. So what um, Neil here, Neil is a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, so he's going to first demonstrate what happens if we stimulate, this is just an aluminum can, uh, because of metal, right? So metal and magnetic, and so Neil is going to demonstrate what happens if we stimulate just with the, magnet, uh, the aluminum can. Okay, okay. and then you, people, you can see there is a movement. You can try again. Okay. Okay. So for this, we actually, I mean, some of you may have MRI before. So certain people should not have this. People who have like a metal clip in the head should not have this. The similar people should not have an MRI. Okay. Now, um, Dr. Gano is a fellow. He, she's, uh, so the Neil is going to, so what Neil doing is that she's stimulating her left side of the brain. So this will cause a uh, twitch in the right side, in the right hand. Okay, so um, can you see that? So we can focus. Yeah, so I think you can all see on the screen there's a twitch that, you know, okay, maybe just one more time? Yeah, okay. Good. So this is just a simple demonstration. So we can, so we can use this coil, um, put it on the head and cause a twitch on there. So in the study, it's gonna show you is that we basically measure this, we can quantify it the degree of activation of this twitch. Okay, okay, I think that's fine. Um, maybe we can say ask Green, how, how, how did it feel? Yeah. So it just feels like a little tiny uh, touch over the scalp, a little pinch, and then it just feels a little bit weird because your arm is moving without you wanting it to move necessarily, but uh, it's not uncomfortable. It's just surprising sensation. <laughs> That's it. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. So, so what I'm going to do next is just tell you some studies that we've done using this method to study uh, brain plasticity. So, so the way that one method we can do it is the method that's called pair associative stimulation. The, what is done, basically, we stimulate a nerve, so the nerve in the wrist, the nerve will send an impulse up to the brain. And it takes about 21 milliseconds. So one millisecond is one thousandth of a second. So it's a fairly short time, but it takes some time for the nerve impulse to reach up to the brain. And we try to do is that we time the nerve impulse and this magnetic impulse at the same time. So if the time it precisely. So what the brain cells, happen to the brain cells is that it has an impulse coming from the nerve, and then the impulse coming from this magnetic stimulation. When, so when the brain cells get two impulses come in at the same time, it's a learning, it's like a learning process. And we do it repeatedly, basically we do this once every 10 seconds for half an hour. We will induce a type of brain plasticity. And what we do here is that we do some measurements before we do this, and then we do some measurement immediately, 30 and 60 minutes after we do this intervention to see how we can affect the brain. And this particular study, we studied people with Parkinson's disease. So people with Parkinson's disease came on two occasions. They, one occasion, they don't take the medication, we call off, and the other occasion, people are on the medication, so we call it on. Okay. So this is the, come the result. this is a control is a normal person without Parkinson's disease. So this is the twitch that we can record from the hand before the intervention, so you can just recognize the size of the uh, excited, how excited the brain is. You can see that this is before, and this is 30 minutes after we do the plasticity uh, intervention. You can see that the response becomes bigger in this normal person. So this is what we expect. So this intervention will make the brain more excitable. So we put the same impulse in, we got a bigger response. 
But this is in people with Parkinson's disease. So this uh, response in this person is a baseline, but after the intervention, there's no difference. So in this particular person with Parkinson's disease, we do this intervention, there's no change. Whereas in normal subject, the response becomes bigger. And it doesn't matter if the person is on or off the medication. So we often do this in a whole group of people, and we did find that there is people with Parkinson's do not respond normally to this uh, intervention that induces brain plasticity. So we see a normal subject, but not in people uh, with Parkinson, and whether uh, the subject is on or off uh, medication. So the next, um, I think some of you will know that one treatment for Parkinson's disease and dystonia is called deep brain stimulation. So not going to talk too much about it. So I think you know that it's we put it's electric wound in the brain is connected to a basic pulse generator battery pack that gives stimulation to the deep brain structure to help with people with Parkinson's disease or dystonia. Now the thing about this is that we actually don't really know how it works. So is open, uh, open question. There's some ideas, we don't know exactly how it works. So what we think, what we'd like to know is that does this treatment with deep brain simulation change brain plasticity? So what we uh, do is we have people who have deep brain stimulation. These are people with Parkinson's disease who have, we call subflamin nucleus deep brain stimulation. So we stimulate people have deep brain in there, and then we use the magnetic stimulation to stimulate the surface of the brain to test the brain plasticity. So in this study, um, we have people with Parkinson's disease who are subflamin nucleus, deep brain symptoms. They're very generous that they come four times. So they, two times they are not taking medication, but we also switch the stimulator on and off. And then two times they're on medication, we switch the stimulator on and off. So what you're seeing here is the response to the plasticity uh, interference. So one is baseline. So no change is one. This is minutes, so 60 minutes after the plasticity response. So in the normal subject, in the green here, you see that there is, the brain become more excitable, about 1.5 to 2 times more than baseline before we do the plasticity uh, in, induction. But in people with Parkinson, when they have medication off, there's no response. And the only time there's response is when the DBS, the deep brain is on and the medication is on. So what it's, I think it tells us is that the medication does not seem to, uh, at least in this group of people with Parkinson, does not restore the plasticity response. But the deep brain stimulation does, together with the medication. So there is this black here is uh, this condition. To, those people have the more or less a normal uh, response, uh, plus this brain plus this response. And the other we have done is began to look at how does the deep brain symptom works, how it's related to plasticity, is that we want to induce plus. So this time we are pairing the deep brain simulation with the magnetic simulation that I show you. So and we choose certain times. So they deliver at very precise times. We, based on our previous study, we're two times, uh, which is three milliseconds, we're in one millisecond is just one thousandth of a second. So these are very short times. We pair these repeatedly. And we think that by pairing these repeatedly, we can reduce, make the brain more excitable. And we have a control, which is based on our previous study, we think that this will not change the uh, plasticity. So the results here is that the two intervals that we, based on previously, think would induce plasticity does uh, induce plasticity. So the way to read these graphs, one is baseline. So we have things above one, that the brain become more excitable. And we do this at 0 to 15, 15 to 30, and 30 to 45 minutes after we induce the plasticity. So what these studies show us is that we can induce plasticity, brain plasticity by combining the deep brain stimulation and the magnetic that you just see. But we have to time it at a certain specific times uh, to induce this type of plasticity. Okay. okay, so in summary for Parkinson's disease, what we other people have found is that general brain plasticity is decreased in people who are more advanced Parkinson's disease. And deep brain stimulation together with, mac, uh, with medication it can restore this brain plasticity. And we can induce the brain classes by combining these together, deep brain stimulation together with the magnetic brain stimulation. 
Okay, so I just want to switch gear a little bit and now to talk about another condition that we see is dystonia. So some of you may, may not be familiar with dystonia. So dystonia is uh, a syndrome. We call it a syndrome because it actually has many causes of dystonia, but generally it's, it's characterized by people with intermittent or sustained contractions and often causing like a twisted posture. It can affect any part of the body, eye, neck, arm, leg, or sometimes the whole body. Um, so there are various types of dystonia. This is one common type because cervical dystonia affects the neck, so people can have neck turned to one side, two to one side, you know, forward, backward, and often a combination of these, um, of these movements. Um, just another type of dystonia is called writer's cramp. So in writer's cramp, um, people would often have, usually often they're doing quite fine, except when they try to write. So when they try to write, then they will have abnormal postures. A picture of someone, when they write, he have this extension of the index finger and the thumb. And often, in this condition, it's got task-specific in the sense that often people affected, nothing else wrong, only problem is when they write. Okay. So, and there are many other forms of dystonia, just two examples of, uh, of dystonia. And again, so we're going to show you some study we did in dystonia with uh, people uh, who has uh, deep brain stimulation. So, uh, for, so we use, the method we use is um, we call EEG. So this is brain wave recording and again, the magnetic brain stimulation. So what we want to know is uh, understand what happened when we do deep brain stimulation and what happened to the rest of the brain and how it works. So this is re electrical brain wave recording or EEG. So these are people with dystonia, they have a deep brain stimulation implanted and we want to know when deep brain stimulation is working, how does it affect the brain waves. And we did find that there are, um, uh, we can record brain waves uh, using a cap, and there are specific times the brain got activated. So at 10 milliseconds, there is a, a negative wave, and then at uh, 25 milliseconds after each pulse is a positive wave. So we clearly find that the deeper activate the surface of the brain with uh, brain wave recording. And again, we also want to induce plasticity in uh, this setting. So again, we pair this deep brain stimulation together with the magnetism you just, you, you just saw, and we paired repeatedly and do some measurement before and afterwards. And similar to what we found in uh, Parkinson's disease, we also found that when we pair this uh, deep brain stimulation together with magnetic simply we're able to induce a brain plasticity. So this is uh, one pairing at baseline, and then after the uh, intervention, we got a bigger response. So again, one is baseline. Uh, so we have two times that, based on our study, we think it is a suitable timing, and we did confirm that induce plasticity in the brain, whereas at different times that we think that it's not the right timing, it has no, no effect. Um, so now the other study that um, we are currently doing is um, looking at, again, using this magnetic brain stimulation. Now, I should actually, before I should, I should mention, magnetic brain stimulation is actually, not only we can use to investigate brain function, it can be used as a treatment. So currently, this magnetic brain stimulation is an approved treatment for depression. So there are people, actually some of the psychiatrists in this hospital runs clinic that use repetitive type of mechanism to treat depression. But currently it's not approved for treating any other conditions. And we have done some studies in the past, for example, using to treat Parkinson's disease and did show some promise. But what um, in this particular study, what I want to show you is that we use this magnetic stimulation, we use them in the back part of the brain, called the cerebellum. The cerebellum is part of the brain that is important for coordination of movement. And more many recent studies show that it is abnormal in both uh, dystonia and Parkinson's disease. But in this particular study, we just published about a month or two ago, is that we stimulate the back part of the brain, called the cerebellum. And what we looked at is, do we change the connection from the cerebellum to the rest of the brain? So what we do this, you, we use uh, we call functional MRI, so magnetic resonance imaging. So this way we can do is we can look at connections from the cerebellum, look at X here, 
And this is the rest of the brain region. This is the rest of the brain region that's known to be connected to the cerebellum. And so what we did, and we have a particular type of stimulation, is called CTPS, stands for Continuous Theta Burst Stimulation. But that, I think, doesn't matter. Basically, it's an intervention, and we show that we can reduce the connection from the cerebellum to the rest of the brain after the subject has received this intervention. And there are studies to show that, um, for example, there may be abnormal connections between this cerebellum and the rest of the brain area. So what we are currently, next step we're going to do is probably just study people with dystonia and see if this, uh, first of all, it's a connection abnormal and if this type of intervention can correct the abnormal brain connections. Okay, so um, to summarize for dystonia, um, we, what we show here is, is that the deep part of the brain, which is the basal ganglia where we insert the deep brain stimulant electrode, is connected to the surface of the brain and is, it happened at very exquisite times. And we can induce brain plasticity by, again, by pairing the deep brain stimulant with the surface brain at very specific times. And um, we can Stimulating one part of the brain with the deep brain stimulation sometimes can increase, sometimes can decrease the connections. So, so, so what are the implications of, of, first of this kind of study? So, first of all, um, I think these studies clarify we do deep brain stimulation, but we don't understand how do the deep part of the brain connect to the surface of the brain. So I think these studies first of clarify know what's the nature and what's the timing of these connections. And we shed light on how deep brain stimulation works. We show that deep brain stimulation can work by changing brain plasticity. And perhaps, more, I think it also implication for potential treatment in the future. If we can pair these, for example, deep brain stimulation with a surface brain stimulation, a specific interval, so this can be explored in the future as a uh, potential treatment based on uh, with, obviously with further research that we have to do. Um, so I, um, I just want to comment a bit what uh, our current studies were doing in the lab and what the future studies. So we have a number of current projects, so uh, we are currently investigating how um, brain connections, we're interested in how one area of brain connects to another, for example, the cerebellum, how it connects to the rest of the brain. So how is it in people with Parkinson's disease, and particularly people with freezing of gait, how is it different from, people with freezing of gait different, have a different connection from people who do not have a freezing of gait uh, with Parkinson's disease. And we are further exploring, I think it just show you that cerebellar stimulation as a potential treatment for people with uh, freezing of gait. And in the dystonia, uh, we are doing some studies. Uh, some of you may know that we uh, use botulinum toxin injection as a treatment for certain forms of dystonia. So we are investigating how does the, this treatment, botulinum toxin injection, changes brain plasticity. We think that the way it works, at least in part, is by changing brain plasticity. And then we will uh, going to be in looking at the effects of the cerebellar stimulation I just show you on how does it affect brain connection? We want to see if it can uh, like normalize. Uh, we know it's abnormal brain connections in people with uh, dystonia. Um, and the other uh, so probably longer term uh, goal of our, our work in the lab is that we want to establish a more effective way to induce brain plasticity by comparing, uh, by pairing the deep brain stimulant with the magnetic stimulant that I show you. And other projects that we do in the lab is to um, record from the deep brain signal people who have uh, uh, deep brain stimulation and help to design, if you like, the next generation of deep brain stimulation devices. We think the next generation of deep brain stimulation devices will be smarter. We will know what the brain is doing and can automatically adjust the, uh, the stimulation to adjust to what the person is doing, what the status of the person is. Currently, we're not at that uh, stage yet. And um, for I just uh, yeah, I just want the cause I think our research has been uh, uh, very grateful for people who have generally donated their time to participate in research. Without people coming to us, we cannot 
really cannot do anything. So um, I just want to emphasize that participation research will help to move the field forward, because without research, we cannot move the field forward. Um, and um, I just want to uh, also acknowledge a number of uh, funding agencies that supported our work. Um, uh, the main funding is from this CI Joint Canadian Health Research, but I want to very, um, acknowledge the uh, Toronto General Western Foundation, which uh, organized this event today, has uh, supported um, the work that we did. And um, the other thing I just uh, want to acknowledge, so I think this uh, slide, and some of you know, this is the uh, neurologist at the Movement Disorder Center. Um, I think some of them have talked before in these sessions before, some, some of you may know at least some of them. And then this is uh, some people work in my lab. This is a bit older slide, some of the newer members are not there, but um, again, I just want to acknowledge them and that because many of the work that I show you is really the work they do. Um, so, thank you very much. Um, uh, again, so what I think maybe we'll do is uh, ask uh, Andrew uh, to come up. Um, Andrew? Oh, okay, good. So, um, Andrew is uh, someone I know for a long time. Andrew has uh, dystonia. Um, so, I think Andrew is going to, is going to talk to us about his experience. And the other thing was that Andrew uh, we, has also participated in our research study as well. So, thank you. So maybe after Andrew, then we can wrap up and we will take off. We take questions from all of you. Okay. So I, uh, I've had dystonia since um, probably I would say 1977, and I, I at first I didn't know what it was. I didn't, I didn't know what I had. I didn't know what to do about it. I was working in industry and and. Um, it, for about five years after I first graduated from university at the undergraduate level and I noticed uh, in the I, I was there for five years and roughly the third year I noticed a problem I had with my writing but towards the end of that five-year period I couldn't even hold a pen properly so uh, you saw a, a picture of a gentleman holding uh, the pen and with the thumb kind of raised well at this point I couldn't write unless I held a pen like this and you know the writing was absolutely terrible, but that's the only thing I could do. I couldn't do anything about it. Now, an interesting thing occurred. I had uh, I didn't like the uh, business world, and I, I tried to get back to school and do a doctoral program, and I finally got in uh, one of the programs at the University of Toronto. But then all of a sudden, I freaked out. I, I was in a humanities and social science study, so all of a sudden, it occurred to me, I'm going to have to write tests, exams, you know, it's not multiple choice where you can tick off, but I'm going to have to write long essays uh, with my pen. And I was in the uh, Toronto, I remember this evening very vividly, I was in the Toronto Public Library one night, and I, you know, they had the, the, we didn't have computers then, so I was just leafing through the cards in the catalog, and I was going to write some notes, uh, try to write some notes in this really awkward fashion on the books I was interested in. And all of a sudden it occurred to me to try my left hand. So I picked up the pen and lo and behold, I could write very legibly with my left hand. So for five years in the doctoral program at the University of Toronto, I wrote all my exams, all my tests with my left hand. No problem. For some reason, when I finished, the, when I graduated from the PhD program, all of a sudden I couldn't write with my left hand anymore. But I couldn't write all that well with my right hand either. So uh, at some point, I did, I did a bunch of work uh, as a postdoctoral fellow. I had a stint at McGill University for about four years. And then I went to the Middle East. And then my dystonia got really bad in both hands. Like when I was there, I started, my hand started twitching quite a, like the, you know, the, the muscles are overactive in the arm. So, you know, the, especially the index finger, this finger, the thumb, and these two fingers, the index and the thumb, you know, they would just twitch uncontrollably at certain periods. Sometimes it would subside, but, you know, there was no treatment for this uh, there, for sure. I didn't know about the treatments here, but uh, my friends took me to uh, an acupuncture clinic one night and they, um, they seemed to hook up needles in my body everywhere except my hands, which I found kind of strange, especially, and there was one at the top of the head. So 
so yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> I did that that for about half an hour that evening, or you know, lay on, lay on their bed and, and with these needles. It must have been a half an hour. It could have been a bit longer, but it actually, it felt better. My, my hands actually felt better for about a week, but then all the symptoms returned. So the twitching, the kind of you know, not writing aspect, all those returned. So I got back to Canada after a couple of years in the Middle East, and uh, you know, my hands would at time, you know, it was really noticeable. Like my my mother noticed that you know, there's this unusual movement in my hands. And she said, look, you got to go see a doctor about this. And I was reluctant because I didn't think there was anything for this. So anyway, I, one thing led to another, and I ended up with, um, uh, in Dr. Ashby's office, who has been mentioned uh, earlier. And I got there, and I, I learned very quickly that he was known as the EMG Queen, King. That's what they referred to him as. And he was you know, the top guy in this area. So they had this technique where they would uh, inject, uh, or so uh, with with n sort of needle probes, they would you know find the muscle that's of interest, that's that's responsible for the twitching, and then inject a little bit of, of Botox right in the spot that's that of the muscle, the spot in the muscle that's activating, uh, doing this abnormal activation of the of the fingers. So that was pretty cool. And uh, this, this was remarkable. This was like a miracle to me. I mean, I, I could start, you know, writing. It was still uncomfortable, uh, but not, I didn't have to hold a pen like this anymore. I could hold it properly. Now, if the Botox started to wear off, and for, for a time I could, I could write pretty, pretty much normally with my right hand. But uh, once the Botox started uh, wearing off, if you will, then the movement was not so much what you saw in the picture with the thumb kind of going up that way, but my index finger and my thumb would kind of ride up as I was writing, like that, like literally exactly in this fashion. And that created a problem with the writing because I, I couldn't write properly. But, uh, you know, for extended periods, I could actually hold a pen properly and write. So, uh, so and this technique used by the, by the doctors here in, at the Toronto Western was, was you know, a first. I, I understand uh, your group invented this protocol. Is that correct? Or? Um, well, I, I probably wouldn't say we invented it, but we're certainly one of the very few places that uh, do this type of injection. I mean, because I, so I think what Andrew was showing this injection is we very precise a targeting of the muscle. So we are probably one of the very few centers, at least in Canada, that do this type of injection. Yeah, so the needle, like the way they pinpoint the muscle in question is that a needle goes in, it's, it's an electrode basically, it's hooked up to an EMG machine. So Dr. Chen, he, he'll, he'll pinpoint the area and then he'll either listen to the sound waves that are coming from the computer or look at the waves. I think you do more listening than looking, mm -hmm. if I recall. So, and, and that's, that technique really works well. Now, when I, I moved out to the, to, to the East to work at one of the universities at one point, uh, New Bruns in New Brunswick, and they, they knew nothing about this technique. So, so the doc, but I did get a doctor who, who would, a neurologist who would inject uh, the Botox. But what he did was very inter interesting. Like he, he, would, he would kind of feel around and ballpark the muscle in question. Like I would you know, move my fingers and, and then he would ballpark the muscle. Now Dr. Chen does something similar. He ballparks it, you know, asks me to move my fingers, but then he, then he pinpoints the exact location with this electrode that we just talked about. Now this ballparking method out east, like it, it did not work. I mean, the, the difference was amazing. It was just absolutely amazing. It kind of made me feel a little more sort of at ease, you know, with the, with the arms. But if I tried to write or anything like that, it was a, a night and day the difference. This technique is um, absolutely marvelous in terms of my experience. Now, the other interesting aspect to the uh, study that was just talked about, now you, you saw uh, the fellow, I for, sorry, I forget your name. Okay. Um, now, you know, we, we saw a zap and you said it was not that uncomfortable or it was not, nothing a big deal. 
And I agree with that. I, I participated in the study. I went about six or seven times um, on a Friday morning, I think, for about three hours at a shot, and they just zapped me for three hours, you know, with a few breaks here and there. <laughs> but there was one, there was two moments, I think, possibly three, but certainly two, where the zap was not, you know, half a second. But it was, I, I forget what it was, but it was either a minute or two minutes, but I swear it, mm -hmm. it felt like 15 minutes. And, you know, they put the electrode on my head and then, you know, they, they zapped me for like, let's say one or two minutes. And then the technician at the end of it, oh, the f very first time they did this to me, uh, she kind of, after the, after the procedure, she said, well, that wasn't too bad, was it? And I looked at her and I said, think Guantanamo. <laughs> she, she started. And, uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I, that was my first impulse to say that. It was not, I do not recommend this uh, procedure uh, if, you have, if you can avoid it. Anyway, it was, it was great to participate in the study. I'm ha happy to make a contribution. And uh, other than that, I, all I say is that the doctors here are doing wonders because for me anyway, oh, I should mention that, um, yeah, I, I was just going to say, for me it's worked, you know, wonders. Now I said, uh, I think not last time, Dr. Chen, but the time before, I think uh, you asked me, well, how's it going, you know, is, this, is, is the treatment working and all that. Mm -hmm. I said, it always works. And Dr. Konsky was, sitting, uh, was right beside Dr. Chen and he goes, well, it doesn't work for everybody. So, you know, it works for some people, uh, I guess. Uh, and you, you would know more about this than I would, but um, for me it's been great. So I appreciate the opportunity to tell my story, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Great. Well, thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah. So I just wanted one to Andrew, I think when you mentioned the, you know, I think it's very common with dystonia to actually didn't get a diagnosis until they see it. Now, because it's, I think Parkinson's is much, people like general practitioners are much more uh, knowledgeable, but, but dystonia, I think, these many cases, many parents are not familiar with it, so they think was something else. So it's not uncommon for us to hear the story that you know have seen other doctors or try the treatments, not getting properly diagnosed. So okay, so I think we'll open up to questions. We're happy to answer questions. Yes, in my own uh, personal experience, I, I have the same problem on the lefty. So uh, going back to the Parkinson's disease, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 1980. A number of years ago, I did develop uh, involuntary movements with my fingers. And now I'm at, and I did go to see uh, Dr. Adam. He was with Dr. Gutman in the Parkinson, uh, out in Scarborough, that area. And he did give me Botox, and I did find it help, but it was very painful. <laughs> right, right in the muscle, I, I would go every two, three months, and he gave me two injections. And one of my questions, I guess, is, is that covered by OCA? Because I found it was about four, it was over $400, the injection, was a little amount. And he was able at that time to get me to uh, uh, have the government pay for it. So I'm not sure if that's available for everybody, the, the Botox. It is expensive. And I did find it very uh, helpful for me. I was able to write. I'm retired now. One of the reasons is that I just can't write. And I think I have a form of writer's cramp. I don't have involuntary movement, but I just can't write. My hand freezes. It's like that, and it, it just, it's just, I feel like I'm not getting the waves from my, from my brain to my, to my hand. So basically, I, I, I guess my question is, is, would something like that be helpful for me at this point? I don't have involuntary movement, but I just, I, I've got like writer's cramp. People look at me and they say, what's your problem? When I say writer's cramp, they don't really know what it is. And I know it's a form of dystonia. I don't know if it beats the Parkinson or not, but uh, if you could just perhaps help me in that, in that regard, okay. I'd be interested in, in going to the, uh, doing the procedure and, and you know, as a right. research. Uh, okay, I think number, so. I think the first one question is: it covered by OHIP? So I think the question it depends. So it is not automatically covered by OHIP, because, uh, but we. If some people have private insurance, we cover private insurance, but some, we, what we do is basically we write to OHIP to, you know, we call this exceptional access program. So to see if they cover it, it's no guarantee, but 
my answer is sometimes they do cover it. We have to we have the right to owe him. Um, the question is whether you know your situation is worth you know, looking to injection debt. I think we will have to 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 see in more detail to 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 discuss it because I think it depends on the individual person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to help uh, chair the, the questions as well, and I'll comment uh, as we go. So the first thing is. Botulinum toxin is a drug, so it's very different from a, uh, something the doctor does. Our uh, uh, component of it is covered by OPEC, obviously, so the doctor's performance of the injection is all covered. It's whether the drug is covered, and that depends on your program and uh, whether you're insured or not. And as uh, Dr. Chen says, we uh, are sometimes successful in getting it, depending on what the problem is. Uh, the government s will consider supporting it for some indications and not others. And as he said, it also depends on the nature of the muscles involved as to whether we think it will help you. And as you heard Dr. Konsky uh, very correctly had said that some patients are helped and other people are not, especially with this writer's disturbance. And for those that haven't heard of it, writer's cramp is not what we all experience in school when you're writing a whole bunch and you get cramping and aching in the arm. That's not what we all got when we wrote uh, essays. It's a very different motor abnormality related to the way the brain is talking to the muscles in the, in the act of writing. And so in a way, it's sort of a disturbed, as you heard, disturbed plasticity in the brain that has induced this. You might be interested, you've all heard of Botox, even though you've not received it. Um, Botox, hot in the, in the press because it's used for um, um, wrinkles and, and uh, other uh, plastic surgery pr um, purposes. Interestingly, the term Botox was coined by a movement disorder specialist. So in our field, not in some other field, but it was coined by a Dr. Stanley Fawn in New York, and they were one of the first centers that was using botulinum toxin injections. It's actually botulinum toxin A type. There are several different types of botulinum toxin. This is the A, and there are actually several manufacturers of the A type now. So actually, Botox is the, the one manufacturer, they, they actually grabbed that name and they, uh, they copyrighted the name after Dr. Fawn coined the, the term. Okay. Yes. Uh, I just want to make sure I understand. Andrew, you do not have Parkinson's. Not that I know of. You have dystonia. Yes. yes. Right. I, but okay. interestingly enough, my dad did have Parkinson's. After. Are they related in terms of the dystonia? In other words, Andrew's father having Parkinson's, would that have affected Andrew with the dystonia? Okay, yeah. So I think the question is, is Parkinson's dystonia related? So uh, in general, no. Most people we see with dystonia, for example, affecting the eye or the neck or the writer's cramp or with the hand like Andrew, do not have Parkinson's. Now, having said that, there is... Uh, it's actually quite common for people to have dystonia. So sometimes we see people with Parkinson's probably have a leg, a foot cramping, you know, like the curling of the toes, turning in of the ankle. It's a quite common phenomenon. So this is a dystonia. Okay, that's why I said dystonia is a syndrome. It's, so Parkinson can has can have dystonia as part of the manifestation of Parkinson's disease. Yeah, and there are also some very uncommon conditions that have both. Parkinson, dystonia, but, probably, well, I, I, but I think we don't need to discuss those. Most people with dystonia beginning in adult life, like you've heard, isolated writing problems, uh, don't evolve to develop Parkinson's. Uh, and as Dr. Chen has indicated, we see patients with the eyes involved, the face, the neck. These are relatively common, what we call adult onset focal idiopathic, meaning we don't know the cause, idiopathic dystonia. However, Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's syndromes, people with other causes of Parkinsonism, not uncommonly have dystonia. It's usually something that occurs later in the course of the illness in those people. Rarely do we see it very early on, so it would be really quite unique or unusual for you, for example, you asked that question, for you to evolve, evolve to having Parkinson's. It's probably unrelated. But Parkinson's patients can benefit a great deal from botulinum toxin injections as well. Um, thank you for your talk, uh, Dr. Chen. My, my question is, can you 
go back to the first part of your talk and remind us again, or tell me because I don't understand, what is the practical implication for someone with Parkinson's to have restored or um, uh, plasticity? Like what, what benefit will the person with Parkinson's get from that? Okay, that's an excellent question. So um, now this is something that we and others are still doing further research on um, because what we, basically what we show is we have signed something abnormality in people say a brain connection or plasticity. So we're looking at ways to, you like, restore it. And often it is a treatment that also works. For example, uh, deep brain stimulation. So, so deep brain stimulation works and it also makes plasticity better. So um, what we trying to do, I think the next step is um, if, uh, let's say we can say we can make in cause make a increased brain plasticity in people with Parkinson's, for example, by you know actually combining this magnetic stimulation with deep brain stimulation. So the next step is to see is this can this be a new treatment or a better treatment? But that would be the next step, I think. Yeah. Yes, over here. I have a question for Andrew. I have um, hand dystonia in both hands as well, and you had mentioned. Um, the invasive uh, mechanism that went on your head. So you didn't have deep brain stimulation, though, did you? Like, where you had an operation, you just tried the invasive um, pattern? Like, can you do that without actually having deep brain stimulation, and is there an effect with it? Well, that stimulation I mentioned, that was just part of the study. It wasn't a treatment. Like it was part of. Yeah. So you can't have that unless you have the deep brain stimulation. Like that, you can't. You can't have one without the other. Uh, no. So so uh, no. You can have. You can have one without the other. So what Andrew possibly is a research study. So he had um, got magnetic brain stimulation, just putting the call on the surface of the head. So that stimulation is not uh, a treatment. We are just looking at what happened with the. Boshan toxin treatment. So, so we have different ways. So sometimes we can use this as a treatment, but often we also sometimes we use it as a uh, measure. So what we Andrew participated in the study, we're using this to measure the brain, or uh, to see how the brain is, rather than as a treatment. So, but to answer the question, yes, you can have deep brain stimulation. Definitely, you don't need to have the magnetic brain stimulation. On the other hand, um, there are treatment with. Magnetic, for example, people being treated for depression. We have done studies in people with Parkinson's disease and dystonia as well. You can also use this magnetic stimulation as a treatment. You don't need to have deep brain stimulation. Okay, but like it won't actually, like I know there's no cure for dystonia, but like it actually won't, like will it make you symptom free? Yeah, right. So, and when we do the treatments, the, the one that Andrew participated is not designed to to help, the, we're just looking at what's wrong with the brain in pubic dystonia. But there are certain studies that were designed as a treatment. Then the hope is only to help people with either Parkinson's disease or dystonia. Um, so certain studies, so for example, it would be sometimes we did, we just finished a study on Parkinson's disease. So it was similar to, I mean, some of you may or may not have Parkinson's in like trial of drugs. So sometimes there's a real drug, sometimes a placebo. Drug. So sometimes we do studies, we have a placebo stimulation and a real stimulation because we wouldn't know whether it works or not. So, um, so when it's a treatment study, then yes, and the goal is to improve symptoms, improve things for, in people with Parkinson or dystonia. So I think so it's depending on uh, the goal of the study. Sometimes we want to, in this part, so often we, to do study, we first have to understand first. So often the first step is just to understand what's the problem. Once you have better understanding, then we can design the next study to be as a treatment. So study, some study is designed to understand the problem, so some, some study we design to as a treatment. Okay. Thank you. Typically the, the treatment component, as Dr. Chen mentioned at the early part of his talk, involves what's called repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, or RTMS. What you saw in the demonstration were individual 
TMS stimulations. And so if you're doing RTMS, it wouldn't be practical to be doing it at the, th at the level that you saw with the stimulation. What you saw was what we call supra-threshold stimulation to induce a muscle contraction. Most of the treatment where you use repetitive stimulation, you're doing it in different areas of the brain. So if you're, in your, if you're depressed and you're being treated by the psychiatrist, you're not stimulating the motor cortex. You're stimulating parts of the brain forward from that that we feel are more a part of mood and behavior. And you're stimulating them at below threshold so that the patient isn't experiencing what you heard Andrew describe. That's something that might happen in an experiment, but it's something that's not practical in terms of uh, long-term therapeutics. Yeah. You, Andrew, you, you mentioned that you, you had the problem with your right hand, and then you came to this realization you could use your left hand. Yes. It's perfectly okay. But it only lasted a certain amount of time. So I'm just wondering, what is your perception of what was going on physically or mentally there? Yeah, I know you're not a doctor, but what, what is your own... <laughs> well, I actually am a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a PhD. <laughs> but they, these guys don't recognize that. Right? Do. That's, why, that's why it doesn't, doesn't appear here. <laughs> <laughs> in, in that case, I, I ask my question again. Well, since I've studied uh, the work of a guy by the name of Sigmund Freud, I would, I would have some depth psychology interpretations of, of that. I, I really don't know. I, I, I'd have to, you know, continue my uh, in-depth psychoanalysis in the al analytic session to come up with a why. Yeah. I just, I don't have an answer. Right. It's very weird. Because uh, now I can, I can sort of write with my left hand, but it, not as well as I did during that five-year five, five year period. I mean, I could write an exam in no time flat, you know, with my left hand. Right now, I struggle writing, but I can still do it with my left hand. Yeah. So, so, okay. but, so, so I would say, I think what Andrew described is not uncommon. So, I mean, people write a scram, they will try to use the norm, don't use your left hand to write, and many time people will also develop this tony on on the left hand um, after a while so i think we what we think what happened is that well there is some abnormal brain often we think there's actually abnormal brain plasticity but it's it is actually not just limited to the brain that controls the right hand or the writing it's just that we only use the right hand typically for because it typically affects a highly skilled task so like writing, sometimes we have also people who play musical instrument can be affected. Usually it's a skill task. So usually people only use the right hand for writing as a skill task. So that, and when you do the left hand, because the brain already have this underlying abnormality, like a normal plasticity, for example, then it will develop this problem um, after a while. So, so we do, do see that happening. Typically in someone with writer's cramp uh, who is very disabled and can't write, we tell them you can try learning with the other side. It takes about six months of regular practice to become proficient in writing with a non-dominant hand, but you are at risk of developing the same problem with the other side. We just don't know who's going to get that. And in fact, that would be a research study. Right? You would be very, if you could collect enough patients that did that and then demonstrate some of the electrophysiological abnormalities that Dr. Chen demonstrated today that were particularly prominent in the people who got it when they wrote with the opposite side and not see them in those that didn't get it, that would really explain a lot about what's going on in the brain. Yes, I saw. Oh. I have a dozen questions. <laughs> how the brain heals itself and in it he uh, talks about a man with Parkinson's I think who lived in South Africa who retrains himself to walk a normal walk rather than the small step Parkinson walk does that have anything to do with brain neuroplasticity uh, yes, I think so, yeah. So I think many of the who pass will 
you know, for example, uh, walking often is easier if the lines, you can step over it, people dancing, people say it's easier than walking, something like that people will tell us. So what we think that there is this brain system that still works and often involving a pacing, you know, like a dancing has a rhythm to it, for example. So I think what probably one the example you give is that person is training himself to use an alternative system, the brain. That is still working, so like the dancing, for example, you can walk, for example, to a pace. Um, so I think, yes, I think this is an example of brain plasticity. So normally you don't use that to walk, you know, but he is training himself to use that system that is still rather intact to be able to walk. I can't avoid commenting though, uh, those in the room that have heard me speak about this guy. Um, in fact, that is brain plasticity and training and learning. It is not healing the disease. Yep. And this man claims through the writings that he does, that he is healing the disease. The disease process is reversing. There is absolutely no evidence for that. And I think his claims are hurtful. His claims are, uh, are not good for our field, to be honest with you. Okay. Yeah. I'll get to you, too. Don't worry. Okay. Um, I have a, a kind of a strange question. When I first was diagnosed, I had... Um, they said it was essential tremor, and then I couldn't write. And to this day, I, I can't really write, and, um, but I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's. And I'm just wondering, I've had a feeling in my heart all along that I didn't have Parkinson's, and I thought maybe it was, now I'm thinking maybe it was dystonia I've had. And is, is there a real difference? Uh, Yes, yeah, so, so, yeah, so I think, as you mentioned, for example, essential tremor, Parkinson, dystonia. Yes, yeah, so they are different. I mean, tend to have different conditions. Now, sometimes we do see people have both. For example, we see people who have essential tremor, then later on they might develop Parkinson's disease. So, obviously, one having one, you're not immune to having another condition. But yes, in general, I think they are different. Now, occasionally, there are people with essential, or with tremor that, um, when we first see them, we may have a question mark, you know, whether this is essential tremor or Parkinson's. I mean, usually they are separate, but occasionally there can be a difficulty in distinguishing it. But usually over time, you know, we can tell the difference. Uh, yeah, writing is a problem with a lot of what we call motor disorders or movement disorders, and writing can be a big problem in Parkinson's disease, not uncommonly an early symptom. But also some patients, un, a little bit contrary to what I said earlier, some patients can present with a writer's dystonia and as their first manifestation of Parkinson's. But that's uncommon. But it's hard to know what you have. Yeah, question over there. Thank you. I think my question was just preempted. I was going to ask about handwriting. Uh, deterioration of handwriting is often a common symptom early in the Parkinson's disease, one of the first things that points to that possibility. And I was wondering if it was totally coincidental that that is the case. Uh, what, oh, my brilliant note says, PD, yes, impairment of handwriting is often an early symptom. Um, and is there any connection or relationship to dystonia? Is it just totally coincidental that that is the case? And I understand it is totally coincidental. Yeah, I, I think that, yes, I think often impaired handwriting is a symptom of Parkinson and dystonia, but usually the type of impairment is different. So, so in the handwriting, often the writing becomes smaller, uh, whereas in dystonia, it's a different. Usually, I mean, there's uh, abnormal movement of the finger. So that's yes, the both in handwriting, but usually the nature of it is is different. That's, that's why you need to see a neurologist that knows what they're doing, obviously. And um, when we see patients presenting with writing disturbances, we evaluate them very carefully for a variety of problems. And as you heard earlier, it's a task-specific abnormality in the early writer's cramp. So when we get the patient to do all sorts of complex tasks when their hands, when they're not writing, you see nothing. Then they pick up the pen, and that's when the motor problem occurs. Whereas in somebody with writing difficulties with Parkinson's, they often have some slowness and stiffness. And so our careful evaluation will show that. Yeah. I just wanted to check. I actually 
Can we just stand there because I had a brain hemorrhage? Oh. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. I had a brain hemorrhage, so I'm wondering because I'm not at all being a candidate for the trend, the the invasive stuff. But can the non-invasive stuff help with hemidystonia as well? Okay. Yeah. 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 So um, thanks. I think the answer is we need to do some more work on this. I think so. In a sense that there are a lot of that well, numbers that are done in people with stroke. Um, now, often people with stroke have spasticity, which is not exactly dystonia, but you know, it's we can say with stroke is somewhat related. So there are some studies in stroke, uh, post-stroke. Um, so some are promising, uh, but currently I think it's not ready as a, uh, if you like, a, a standard treatment at this point. But I think that certainly there is, uh, again, for brain plasticity, the role to in, you know maybe promote the beneficial type brain plasticity in this situation. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, what are the success rates with regard to cervical dystonia and um, this combination of the deep brain stimulation and the other non Okay. So, okay. Right. So, right. So, now, the cervical dystonia, I was first of all, is these are not the first treatment. Usually, we use botulinum toxin as the first treatment because they're often much less invasive, um, sometimes use medications. But we've used deep brain stimulation in certain people who doesn't respond to the other usual treatment who obviously we evaluate that. So, so deep brain stimulation is a treatment for you know, people who doesn't respond to other uh, less invasive or standard uh, treatment. Um, now the uh, magnetic stimulation that we see uh, is not a, not a standard treatment. Uh, so we are, it's a research. Um, so I think that this is something that we will, uh, other people work on in the future. So maybe it's a, maybe even combined with deep brain stimulation, but currently it's not a standard treatment. There's something we need to do more research on and uh, to see how, how that works. Yeah. So one of the things you get in these sessions is cutting edge stuff that really hasn't hit the, uh, the common market yet. And we're, we obviously recognize the need to do things better. Um, and each of the things that we're providing for patients with the various different uh, conditions we're talking about can help some, but they still leave a lot of unanswered questions with a lot of patients with symptoms that we're not adequately handling. And we recognize that, and that's why these kinds of things need to uh, be advanced. Any more burning questions? I think we've got room maybe for one, one, one more. One Last more. one. Um, my question is just regarding the papers that were discussed earlier that paired uh, deep brain stimulation and medication. Um, from my understanding, um, that they increased uh, brain plasticity of uh, the response. Does that mean that the brain was more capable of making new connections? Is, is that what it was saying? Right. Yeah. So I think the question is that means to activate a new connection, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what um, I don't, probably not a new connection, but what we think would believe doing, we are strengthening certain existing connections. So uh, we can we think that the, you know, by different timings, we are looking at different connections. So we believe think that we can, by doing this interface, you can strengthen a specific connection. That. Um, but I think what the next step is to then is to, so we first show that we can do it, uh, but to, to make it last, we're going to have to do it repeatedly. And we have to, the next step to research would be to see if uh, strengthening this you know, particular connection uh, will have an effect on the clinical outcome. That, that will be the next, I haven't done that one yet. And I was just wondering, they were pairing the deep brain stimulation with certain medications. Did they say what medications they were using in the study? Oh, okay, oh, so, so in the study in people with Parkinson's disease, so they are basically, the, so basically is the usual medication that, the, we don't change the medication, people. So, I mean, typically is levodopa, uh, and then together with some other, other type of medication. But in the study, we just have paid people on whatever medication they're normally on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think we're gonna call it quits. This has been, a, a, I think, a great session. You've seen some cutting edge technology. You've heard from a, a world leader in his field. Um, I think that uh, 
We are here, as I told you, to try to provide you some insights into what's going on in this, this field, give you an idea of what we're doing in our research programs. Uh, you saw from the slide that Dr. Chen showed earlier that we have nine full-time faculty members. Each of us are rotating through these speaker series. If you have any topics related to your disorder or movement, in, movement disorders in general, or if you're being cared for by one of the faculty members that you'd like to hear from that hasn't spoken yet, please uh, let us know. Uh, we discuss these sessions in our faculty meetings along with the foundation representatives, and um, we're doing this uh, now biannually, I guess, so uh, we'll be coming along probably in another six months for another session. Um, I just remind you that uh, if you're interested in hearing more about the research that you heard about today, or you'd like to volunteer, despite what you heard earlier, um, we have some people with uh, uh, trainee name tags uh, that uh, I'd like you to, um, to approach. Um, if we don't have your email address for these sessions, or if you have additional questions, or if you have additional suggestions, please speak to Steph uh, Finley at the back there. Wave your arm so that you know Stephanie's standing there. So she'll um, make sure you're on the mailing list and make sure that we get the input that, that you have. Um, if you have any positive or negative um, um, input on these sessions, we want to make them valuable to you. We want to optimize what you get out of them. Uh, and so, uh, and I hope you've got uh, quite a bit out of it today. I'd like to thank Stephanie, the foundation, for uh, supporting us uh, today, um, and uh, Liza, who couldn't be here for her, uh, her push and her idea to make these happen. The Milnes, as I say posthumously, uh, for their ongoing uh, support for the session. To um, Dr. Paskakis, uh, for his uh, participation, <laughs> got him, <laughs> and uh, Dr. Chen and his team for the presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you.